<laughs> I'll be talking about what cultures today can learn from each other, as it says, based off of my experiences. Uh, but the the uh, the format will be offering sort of a general lesson that cultures can learn from each other, and then a specific experience that I had uh, that exemplified the lesson. So the first lesson that cultures can learn from each other is there are different degrees of expressions for a particular trait. So what I mean by that is, well, let me show you the example. Femininity and masculinity. So different cultures, I argue, will have a different expression along a continuum. Let's say it's very masculine, very feminine. And I didn't know that different places would have different expressions along such a continuum. But I realized this in China, and I realized that by uh, a yoga class that I took while I was there, and mistakenly going to my yoga class and not knowing that it wasn't yoga this time, that it was uh, a feminine dance class. I didn't know this. So they, they, they told me through translation that it was balance. And it was all women, but it was always all, all women. So I didn't think anything of it. And then one said, I don't know if you should be here. This is balance class. I was like, well, that sounds cool. You know, I'll learn some, like, you know, how, to, how to keep my balance. And I like that. But then the leader walked up and played this music, and it was very effeminate. And she started, oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to introduce where I was. I was in Zhuhai, which is near Hong Kong in the south. So that's where this and the next story take place. Oh, there's some Gucci. Anyway, there was, uh, those are some of the dance moves of my yoga instructor. And as she started doing these things, I looked around. I wasn't very self-conscious because you're in a whole different country and you don't know anyone. And um, So I thought, what the heck? So, you know, I started doing these feminine moves and these leg wisps or whatever. And I started to feel something. Like, like, this is kind of a neat energy I'm, 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 that's, that's, that I'm feeling here. What, what is this? And then I looked out, and this was in a, a gym, like, a, like an LA Fitness or a Bally's or something, a Lifetime Fitness that we have here. And there's the, there's the men over by these big metal plates, you know? And they're just, and they're trying to. And after this class, <coughs> I, I reflected on it, and I thought, you know, that's, that's really the difference here. You have this... The masculine power is about conquering something. It's about proving yourself. It's about, you know, getting there. It's about lifting that weight. It could be defeating your opponent. It could be, I'm going to figure out that math problem. You know, it could be, I'm going to figure out how to, how to uh, overcome that disease. There's some sort of uh, necessary, uh, you have to accomplish something to prove yourself. Whereas this, to me, was about an expression, a, a feeling, um, an enjoyment, a being, uh, a nurturing, uh, these things that I, that I describe as, fe as, as, as femininity. <laughs> this term feminine power had been introduced to me in the months earlier, and so this was just actually the latest example of it, but this is where I really felt it. <clears throat> and then I thought of what I saw outside of the gym. And I thought about the men in southern China. And these are the guys at my gym. These are the trainers. These are two friends. And these are three young men out on a Saturday or Friday night. <coughs> at night. And I noticed that they're just more effeminate. They're more touchy-feely. You know, men in America probably wouldn't do this. Men, uh, a, a trainer at a gym in the U.S. probably wouldn't pose this way. He'd be more macho. As we, uh, you know, as they as I consider it. And I thought, well, taken from my book, I had to wonder how a society's embodiment along this continuum of femininity and masculinity influences national aspects of business, art, policy, and philosophy. Specifically, I thought about how China conducts foreign policy, 
And then I thought about the U.S. approach. Uh, how many countries has the U.S. invaded in the last 50 years or 100 years? How many countries has China invaded in the last 50 or 100 years? You know, I can count the amount of countries uh, China has invaded on one hand. And I can't count the number of countries the U.S. has invaded on both hands and both of my feet, right? I thought about China, Chinese domestic policy, and then I considered how the U.S. likes to address its social ailments by having a war with them. You know, it's the war on poverty, the war on drugs. It suddenly occurred to me just how far tilted America is toward the masculine. So much so that the terms for gender equality discussion are drawn in the masculine. I learned that gender appreciation and equality are not about pretending the differences between masculine and feminine aren't there. That equality means advocating that women can do everything men can. It's about realizing that femininity is equal for what it is. My lesson in feminine and masculine power was just the example of the greater lesson, which was, as stated at the beginning, that there are different degrees of expression for a particular trait in swim cultures. Lesson two. Concepts can be defined, expressed in different ways. And the concept I chose was freedom. So my first day in China, I just got up and I did what we, we, all, we all would probably do. I just walked around my neighborhood. And I looked at you know the different stores and um, what they were selling. Uh, you know, the different restaurants, what people were wearing. I just got a load of the whole, the whole neighborhood that I lived in. It was this lovely older neighborhood of Zhuhai. It used to be the old downtown when fishing drove the economy. Big old trees growing between sidewalk gaps. And a very festive uh, atmosphere as well. People were all out. It, it felt like to me like a neighborhood event. Like if, like, like there's the Lynn Lake Festival on Lindale Lake in South Minneapolis, or there's like the Loring Park Art Festival in downtown Minneapolis where everyone's out having a good time. It felt like that there, only there was no festival. It was just like a Tuesday. You know, it was just a normal day. But everyone was out and talking. They would like yell across the street to each other because they knew it, they knew one another. You would never see that happen in uptown or anywhere like that in Minneapolis, even in highly populated areas. So the 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 the, the last uh, stimulus for this thought process was this. Uh, I was walking back to my apartment, I was near it, and I saw these two young, young men, maybe 20, maybe. And they had one of these claw machines. And inside, and mine, you know, the cartoon and all the stuff that might attract children, inside were packs of cigarettes. <laughs> And then that was the impetus for this paragraph. The leisurely feel of my neighborhood was quite freeing. I realized that the concept of freedom would depend on what part of China was being addressed. On the local level, here were these boys playing a cartoon-covered arcade game for cigarettes. I saw cars driving and parked in ways that would entice parking tickets in Minneapolis. I saw people walking in the street with an open can of beer, also illegal in my home city. In the coming days, however, I would also encounter the well-known nationwide restrictions, namely internet censorship. Such top-heavy social orders seemed to counterbalance the lack of legal enforcement at the neighborhood level. In all, I learned freedom's aspect as a malleable, multi-definable notion uniquely manifested from the different recipes of different places all over the world. So if you ask 10 people down the street, is China more free than the US? They're all going to say, well, 9 out of 10 are going to say no. They're going to think of the internet and things like that. Freedom of religion, perhaps. But I, I got to tell you, when I was walking around, I felt very free with all the people talking to each other, like, like there was a festival. And they could do things like that, which arguably isn't good, but it certainly is a freedom they have that we don't have here. So the idea of freedom uh, was, is my example of concepts can be defined, expressed uh, in different ways in different cultures.
Number three. Okay, commonalities and the universality of, of, of custom and thought. That's kind of a, a mouthful. The universal. So I want to talk about things that, that, that cultures have in common. And the one I choose is political ideologies. And for this one, we're actually going to go to East Africa. We're going to, we're going to go to Tanzania. Because it's hard to get actually a feel for political ideology in China because they don't vote, so it's hard to know. But in East Africa, they do. So we have Africa here, East Africa, Tanzania, and I was pretty much right in the center in this tiny village called Madalula. No electricity, no running water. And here are two buildings in the village. One is the local headquarters for the CCM party. Next door, is the headquarters for the opposing party, um, uh, Chidema. I'll, I'll run through this briefly. CCM, Chama Cha Mapanduzi, Party of the Revolution. Chidema is a portmanteau for Chama Cha Democracy and Nama Endeleo, which means uh, Party for Democracy and Progress. What struck me about these two parties, uh, well, first was that they were two major parties. And then, Look at the breakdown of the two parties. So Chidema, it's the youth, <coughs> urban, party of progress, they're for the people, anti-corruption, education and healthcare are stressed, a peace sign. CCM, older voters, rural, traditional, business-minded, <coughs> economic growth. Do you see something here that's common with the way things are in the US? <coughs> if I had to ask you which of these was more like the Republican Party and which is more like the Democratic Party, I think you would all agree on which is which. And I was just simply struck by how wherever you go in the world, at least here, Tanzania, and of course from what I've learned and read about other parts of the world, the human uh, seems to be a species with, with, with thinking that breaks down politically and ideologically into two large camps, the conservatives and the progressive or the liberals. And I just thought it was interesting seeing that here in Tanzania. Oh, here are the two candidates. She ran for the, C uh, the Chidema, he ran for CCM, and he actually came to our village and had a campaign stop. There he is, and they're holding up signs with his head on it. And I'm like, well, this is also similar to how we do it in the US. He would end up winning the election. But again, the point of, that I want to drive home is the idea that they had these two parties and they were so similar in comparison to the, the, the two that we have here. Number four, how cultures are different, but they complement one another complement. So the cooperation of different custom and thought, and by that I mean how one culture's thought and custom can work with another culture's. And the specific uh, custom and thought I want to talk about is the idea of contentment and mindfulness. I know these are broad issues, but you'll understand what I'm talking about in a moment. So I went to central China uh, Wudang Shan, which uh, is a mountain, a beautiful mountain in central China in Hubei province. It's where Tai Chi originated, the martial art Tai Chi, which is a real slow, rhythmic martial art. They also practice Kung Fu. There's old temples up there from like the year zero. It's very historic. There's a lot of local tourists that go there. And I went there and I spent a few days learning, learning Tai Chi. Sorry again about this glitchy. So when I went up there, this is the view from this cement slab. We would practice our Tai Chi, and I was up there with like eight students, all were Chinese. I was the only Westerner. They all called me Feng Xiang, my Chinese name. I never heard my name the whole nine or ten days that I was up there, but I got used to being called Feng Xiang. It's kind of funny how that works. Mm -hmm. um, and we would stand on this slab, and we would practice our martial arts, and the, the views were just stunning. I wish the screen was a little better, but you get the idea that it just went off in the distance. <coughs> this valley was just so lovely. These shades of green. And the, the complementary nature of the two cultures was exemplified when I looked over on, on one of my first days. I was on this cement slab. I looked over the edge, and there were four students doing some shoveling, some clearing out of this hill, this mound of dirt, apparently, I, I think, to make a way for, for, a, uh, for a sidewalk. So I grabbed a spare shovel, and I thought to lend a hand. 
But it turned out that even for something as ordinary as shoveling, I was taken to task. The trainer down there, a trainer in making, 30-ish brute of a guy with a thick tuft of hair and the start of a master's beard. Uh, this is him right there. You can't see his face, but that's him. He interrupted my work to show me how it was done. So he took the shovel back from me, and he blurted, Ha! The shovel prepared for battle. Whew! It thrust into the dirt pile. Whoa! It removed with a load of dirt. I don't think he was being funny either. Seeing this wasn't all that surprising, it was a martial arts school. But at the same time, it provided a striking example by taking a nondescript chore and perfecting it. The trainer didn't think about how to, how to get the dirt moved faster or easier, but how, to, but how uh, to get the shoveling done better, being present and honing the kinetics. He focused on all the movement involved in this simple shovel thrust, the, up, the, the upright torso, the curve and twist of each arm, the bent knees, the body as a temple of energy. I took back the shovel and tried, but I revealed the same difficulties I had on top of the concrete platform. I wasn't used to thinking in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't used to thinking about form, but function. You got a bigger shovel in a wheelbarrow, I thought? I was ignorant of the fact that maybe here the task wasn't about the accomplishment. So I simply marveled. From the first day I met the gang shoveling dirt to all the daily practice sessions in between, I was continuously struck by how kinetic my peers were. Oh, sorry. So here they are practicing one day. Here they are again, working on perfecting the punch. He's showing those boys how to do it. He's working with the sword and he's practicing some, some choreography. <laughs> I also realized, though, that my mental MO had some advantages. See, one afternoon, a half dozen of us students walked down into the valley forest to gather firewood for kindling, uh, firewood and kindling for the kitchen stove. Down along the woodsy trail, my 19-year-old English student, I had been teaching English there as a way to pay for my stay. We worked that out. My 19-year-old English student had a problem bagging a pile of twigs and pine needles. She thought to remedy the risk of cutting her hands by taking two five-foot-long sticks to pinch and lift the pile. She wasn't getting too far, though, just as I don't get too far when eating rice with chopsticks. I noticed next to her on the ground two rake-like tools, so I picked them up and motioned to her, allow me. Then I bundled the sticks, uh, the stick needle salad with my tongs and hoisted a generous amount into the bag. So clever, Feng Xiang, she said. Ah, shucks, I thought. I just eat different, that's all. When we finished gathering, we bundled all the logs and branches using vines for string. We needed a tight packing to secure them up the narrow and hilly path, but jutting branches from the bundle still had to be snapped off, and one stubby branch was, tr was proving troublesome despite the kung fu trained stop kicks the guys were attacking it with. I then noticed a large rock, picked it up, motioned, allow me, once more, and I wedged it under the branch to construct a crude lever. The force of my undisciplined, less effective kick was nonetheless enough to snap it off. This move gained me a few more grateful recipients of my cleverness. I realized the saying, a leopard doesn't change his spots, this may have put me at a disadvantage up on the concrete slam uh, doing the Tai Chi, but my restless and problem-solving mind also proved useful. I was pleased to be able to contribute something. In all, from landscaping to lumberjacking, the other's strengths seemed to lie in bettering the use of their body to get the job done. I sought to get things done by invention. These are generalizations, of course, but in the individual people and in these examples we see illustrations. And in the big picture, we see trends. I couldn't help but wonder whether our solutions exemplified the development of the East and the West. While the East perfected the punch, the West perfected the gun. But while the West has military dominance, more advanced technology, and is richer than China, I yet had to question the price of prosperity. If born, if born from minds always running and missing out on so much beauty, and the constant pursuit for bigger, faster, more. 
which was at odds with how they lived their life up there. What was clear was that the historic isolation of the world's peoples allowed them to hone their culture and strengths. And this quaint display in the woods and of my stay overall revealed the benefits in store when we learn such strengths from each other. I think that that uh, sums up not only what <coughs> cultures can learn from each other, but why uh, they should learn from each other. Because between my ability to snap off that twig and their ability to teach me how to slow my mind down and just chill, um, we made a pretty good team up there. And that, I think, is basically what the East and the West can do on a large scale. So to review, cultures can learn from each other that there are different degrees of expression for a particular trait, whether it's superstition or masculinity, femininity, or whatever. That concept can be defined, expressed in different ways, whether it be freedom or another. Uh, that some things are universal, like a two-party, roughly a two-party <coughs> system, two, two main ideologies, and complements how different things can work together for, for a bigger whole. And I do have one more bonus one, which I realized when I, I looked at these four, I realized that when, when I understood that this is where America was with masculinity and femininity, and this is where China was, that there was certainly a lot more to humanity than I realized. I just knew this. But when I recognize this, suddenly there's this. And of course there are cultures this way, and there are cultures this way, and there's probably cultures this way. And so you realize that, 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 that the potential for humanity is just so much bigger than, than what you thought uh, when you stay just with your own culture. And of course we're blessed in America because we have so many different cultures right here. So we can learn from the Hmong and the Chinese and my, my roots in northern Minnesota and the Mennonites and uh, in Indiana, or Illinois, sorry. Um, um, so, and, and when you do all that, it's just, it's, it's, it's enriching, and you appreciate things, and stereotypes, and maybe prejudices just fall, and everything just, I don't know, just this, this uh, collection of cooperation and appreciation. And so my last thing that we can learn from each other is that, indeed, what I said, that different cultural expressions reveal the potential for humanity. And these are just photos that I've taken throughout the years of all the different ways uh, people that I've encountered uh, have posed for the camera and, and, and their versions of it. This is a minority group in China. Uh, here's four more pictures. Ten, uh, this is taken in Thailand from the trip from school last year. This is a, Ga a Ghanaian that I met here in Minneapolis. This is a this couple has married 75 years. I interviewed them earlier last fall. This is actually taken from North Korea. This is a friend of mine who did that one. I give him credit. And then here's finally four more. This is our dance team. Farmer in Iowa, Thailand. And this is actually Haiti. But the human species is super unique. Like, like more than unique. One of a kind in how much variety there is within the one species. And that's a fun thing to appreciate and experience. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
So you're with your psychology background. Do you think that, you know, the masculine feminine, I think that's so interesting you talk about that because we grew up in Tanzania where the boys would come dressed in all pink and I'd be like, oh, she's so pretty, oh wait, it's a boy because, you know, there's mm -hmm. no color difference. Mm -hmm. Did you, do you feel like because of like psychology and how like America is trying to put people <coughs> in like boxes because of, because that's so prevalent right now, you know, that, that we're kind of, we're, that, that, that's why there's so much more of a blend in other countries, like, you know, of, between the two energies and over here, mm -hmm. there's, it's like society, societally placed because of like psychology and how prevalent it is, you know, like, do you, do you, do you think like that's a correlation or? Like, yeah, there's a lot of labels here. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that, that that's a pursuit of understanding. Like you have to give measurements of things to determine where you stand in these traits. Like IQ of over 140, you're genius. Under, you're not. And like in Tanzania, they they won't even they measure for something right. like that. Right, right. So, so know, yeah, like, yeah. Because then you once you're over 140, then you join this gifted and talented club, you know. And if you're under, <coughs> then you're not part of it. And so it can change your life a lot, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's for the pursuit of good, though. Um, I, I think America's, there's a lot of curiosity and a lot of wanting to maximize people's potential, and so by putting them in these places, we feel we can really get the most out of them. But that does mean measurements and labels, and yeah, and there's an inherent downside to that, too. Just to kind of go off what you're saying, from my own experience of living in China, like, there are things there that are considered masculine that we don't consider here. Like, where I lived in China, if a man smiled in a picture, that was, like, feminine. Like, you were not mm. supposed to smile. You are supposed to be stone cold, like, mm. military, no smiling. And so that was an issue, because when I, I'd always smile in <laughs> pictures, and they'd be like, oh, no, 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 like, why do you still smile? Mm -hmm. So, but I think here, kind of what you're going on, we have access to more information because we don't have censorships as much as China does. So that allows people to self-educate and become self-aware of situations that they may not be in China. But the idea of masculinity and femininity, each, like, they have their own idea of what it is. If you even want to see a more extreme, look at South Korea right now. What they consider masculine for men is, you know, almost androgynous, what we would call here. Mm -hmm. Men wear eyeliner, makeup. So, I mean, China is actually, to me, is very in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's a nice blend. But yeah, just each country, in my own experience, has their, some things that I don't consider masculine, yeah. but they do. And things that I, we consider feminine, but they don't. That that like, th th like handbags, like in China, men carry handbags that look what we would call like a purse. But over there, it's just a bag. Maybe I'm an example of what you don't like, because here I am labeling these guys as feminine. And there, they don't probably have these kinds of ideas. I, I, it's not that I don't like, I just think it comes from a, a cult, a, an American cult. Like, as a foreigner in this country, because mm -hmm. like, I moved here when I was 18, I feel like what I see over here a is society like... society that likes categories. Yes. And yeah. It's very scientific. And, yeah. and so it's really amazing to hear like somebody who grew up where that's very like inherently part of your upbringing, and then yeah. you go to a different country, and like and like for you as well, like you go somewhere else, and it's like completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just and I was just wondering if you, because I feel like it has to do a lot with psychology and the fact that it's so like you know like you said putting your own yeah. boxes and everything. And I was yeah, it's it's, it's an analytical versus of just being. <laughs> And I was just always trying to figure out when I did Tai Chi, okay, if my arm is here, and then it's got to go here, and then my leg has to do, and I tried to like remember five things at the same time to just, because you have a head, you have a torso, you have legs and arms, you have like five or six different units that you have to move correctly. And if you try to do that at the same time, you're never going to get, so I was constantly screwing up my choreography. And they were getting frustrated. The one guy, the master, the one trainer, he just was like, he, he did that. He's like one of those laughs. Like, are you stupid? <laughs> and, one of those, and I'm just, and I got offended. Um, but then I thought, you know, I don't blame him. Like, I'm, I'm terrible at this. You know, and they picked it up just really fast. You know, like it was just second nature. Just do the choreography. But I kept thinking about it. Anyway, Brendan, thank you. My pleasure. This is this is perfect for where we are headed for the rest of this course.
Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure.